So hello there and welcome to this class whereby today I want us to look at a chemistry form 3 paper whereby it is chemistry paper 1 form 3. So let's begin. The first question is asking, explain why burning magnesium in sulfur for oxide continues to burn but for a burning splint, the burning splint will be extinguished immediately. So I can rephrase the question and say or ask, why does magnesium continue to burn in a gas jar full of sulfur 4 oxide while a burning splint is going to be extinguished immediately? So, like first of all, we see that when magnesium is burning, it produces a lot of energy. Now, this energy is the one responsible for breaking down the sulfur 4 oxide to sulfur and oxygen molecules. Now, magnesium uses the oxygen molecules that have been produced in order to continue with combustion. However, we see that in a burning splint, while the burning splint is burning, it produces very low energy. Now, so, since it produces the very low energy, we see that the energy is not able to break down the sulfur 4 oxide to sulfur and oxygen molecules. Now, since this happened, we see that the sulfur 4 oxide is going to extinguish the burning splint. The question, however, can also be rephrased by, but by this time, uh, the carbon 4 oxide gas will be used, whereby we might be asked, explain why burning magnesium in a gas jar full of carbon 4 oxide continues to burn, while for burning splints is going to be extinguished immediately. So the explanation is still the same. While the magnesium is burning, it produces a lot of energy, whereby this energy is responsible to break down the carbon 4 oxide to carbon and oxygen molecules. Now, magnesium in turn uses the oxygen molecules to continue with combustion. However, by looking at the burning splint, the burning splint during burning produces very low energy, and this energy cannot be able to split the carbon 4 oxide to carbon and oxygen molecules, and therefore, the carbon 4 oxide is going to extinguish the burning splint. Now, that's the answer to that question. So, let's go to the next question, whereby the next question is asking, Draw the structural formula and name one positional isomer of C4H8. So uh, we all know that C4H8 is originating from a hydrocarbon family or a classification of hydrocarbon family, which is referred to as the alkenes. So we have three classifications of hydrocarbons, whereby the first classification we have the alkenes, which have a single bond. We also have alkenes which have a double bond and then finally we have alkynes which have a triple bond so the people that are going to continue with chemistry in front you are going to see that we also have uh, uh, we also have the aromatic hydrocarbons so this question is asking about this structure whereby this structure is called a butene or uh, by using the upac name we see that this structure is called butuanein so this structure, we'll call it butuan in because the double bond is immediately located after the first carbon atom. So the question is asking about the isomer, but what is an isomer? So an isomer is defined as these are compounds that have the same molecular formula, but different structural formula. So the molecular formula must be same. Like for this example, we see that the molecular formula for this is C4H8. That's the molecular formula. And as you can see, the structure, that is the structure. And giving the structure the name, this is butuan in because the double bond is, uh, is coming after the first carbon atom. So uh, we have been asked to draw the isomer of butuan in. So remember the isomer must have the same molecular formula as the predecessor but different structural formula. So the first isomer of this butuan in is as you can see. So we have but2 in. So the question was asking about positional isomerism, positional isomer, whereby in positional isomer you just move the position of the double bond. Now if you move the position of the double bond you are going to get another isomer. Like for example, you see this was but1 in and then for the isomer we have but2 in. But2 in since the double bond is now coming from the second carbon atom. Now to understand this isomerism further, let's look at another example. 
uh, whereby let's now look at pentane. So pentane is coming from the, uh, from the classification family of hydrocarbon, which is referred to as the alkanes. So it is called pentane. The name ends with A and E. It is called pentane. So since the name ends with A and E, it tells us that it comes from the classification of hydrocarbon, which is an alkane, because the name also ends with A and E. So pentane, this is an alkane. And as you can see, it has five carbon atoms, and then it also has 12 hydrogen atoms. So this is the structure of pentane. Now let's draw the isomer of pentane. So what you should remember is that for, for, for we to draw the isomer of pentane, the isomer, remember the definition is that these are compounds having the same molecular formula, which is C5H12, uh, like according to a pentane, but different structural formula. So all we are going to do is that we are just going to change the structure of pentane, taking note that the molecular formula must remain the same. So this is the structure of pentane. Now, and that is the structure of the isomer of pentane. So this structure is referred to as neopentane. So that is the neopentane whereby we have one central carbon atom surrounded by four carbon atoms. And then in the four carbon atoms, we equally distribute the hydrogen atoms. So uh, yeah, the, the carbon atoms in the neopentane are five and the hydrogen atoms, as you can count, they are exactly 12. Now, the first structure of pentane, we see that it has five carbon atoms and 12 hydrogen atoms. So the isomer, the neopentane, we see that it also has five carbon atoms and 12 hydrogen atoms. So that is an isomer of pentane. So remember, these are compounds. So these are compounds having the same uh, molecular formula, but different structural formula. So that is an isomer. So let's go to the next question, whereby this question is asking, dry hydrogen chloride gas, which is HCl gas, was dissolved in water, as you can see. So dry HCl gas was dissolved in water, as you can see. So the question is asking, the first question is asking, what was the use of the inverted funnel? So why was the inverted funnel used, as you can see? So the inverted funnel was used, first of all, in order to provide a large surface area over which the hydrogen chloride gas was going to dissolve in water. So that's the first answer. So the second answer will say that the inverted funnel was used uh, in order to prevent the sucking back of water from the trough or the beaker and onto the source of the HCl gas. So why will the water be sucked onto the tube and onto the source of the HCl gas. So the water will be sucked back if we were not using the inverted funnel. So the water will be sucked back because the HCl gas is very soluble in water. So the hydrogen chloride gas is very soluble in water. Since it is very soluble, it has a very high tendency to dissolve in water. Now, due to this high tendency to dissolve in water, it is going to suck the water in order to dissolve the water. And finally, what will happen is that we will notice that the HCl gas, if, if we are not using the funnel, uh, like we will notice that the water rather will be sucked from the trough and onto the source of the HCl gas. Why? Because the HCl gas is very soluble. Therefore, it will pull the water in order to dissolve the water at a given force. Now, the answer here, here is the second answer. So the second answer is that we are using the inverted funnel in order to prevent the sucking back of water from the, uh, from the trough and onto the source of the HCl. So that's the second reason why we are using an inverted funnel. So remember the first reason we say that to provide a large, a large surface area over which the HCl will dissolve in water. And then the second one is, is that the inverted funnel is used in order to prevent the sucking back of water from the beaker onto the source of the HCl where it's coming from. So the second question, which is B, we are being asked, state the observations that were made on the litmus paper. Because we see that we have a litmus paper. So the litmus paper, we are being told that it is blue litmus paper. So what will happen is that the blue litmus paper is going to change to red color. 
So why will the blue litmus paper change to red? So the blue litmus paper will change to red because the HCl gas is an acidic gas. Now, this HCl gas, as it dissolves in water, it produces hydrogen ions, whereby the hydrogen ions are responsible for changing the blue litmus paper to red in color. So in Form 1, we differentiated between an acid and a base. And an acid, we say that these are substances which dissolve in water to produce hydrogen ions. Whereas for base, we, we define a base as these are substances which dissolve in order to produce hydroxyl ions. Now, since here we have hydrogen chloride gas, we see that the hydrogen chloride is going to dissolve in water to produce hydrogen ions. Now, these hydrogen ions are the ones responsible for changing the blue litmus paper to red, indicating that the solution that has been formed is acidic. So the next question is asking, state the observations that will have been made if methyl benzene was to be used instead of water. Now, if methyl benzene was used instead of water, the litmus paper wouldn't have changed any color. So the litmus paper will still remain to be blue in color. But what is the reason? So the reason is it's because we see that methyl benzene does not have any charges. Now, since it doesn't have any charges, it's not going to ionize the HCl or the hydrogen chloride gas. So since it's, not, it's unable to ionize the hydrogen chloride gas, we see that in turn, the hydrogen chloride will not anyhow react with the blue litmus paper to indicate any color change. And for us to use the methyl benzene, finally, we see that the blue litmus paper is going to still remain to be blue in color. Why? Because methyl benzene is non-polarized. It doesn't have any charges. And since it doesn't have any charges, again, it's not going to ionize the hydrogen chloride gas, which is responsible to give an indication of the uh, litmus paper if the solution of the gas is basic or acidic. Now let's go to the next question whereby we are being asked. Using sodium hydroxide, explain how you can be able to differentiate between copper 2 ions and ion 2 ions. So using sodium hydroxide, that's the chemical that we have been provided with. So the first step, we are going to dissolve the sodium hydroxide in copper 2 ions, and then, fi and then finally, we dissolve the sodium hydroxide to ion 2 ions. Then we make an observation of the color change. Now, as you can see here, we see that if we dissolve sodium hydroxide in copper 2 ions, uh, we are going to get copper 2 hydroxide, which is a blue precipitate, and sodium uh, in aqueous form. So the next experiment, we see that if we dissolve sodium hydroxide in ion, uh, yeah, in ion 2 ions, uh, we are going to get ion 2 hydroxide plus sodium in aqueous form. Now, the ion 2 hydroxide is a green precipitate. So remember the first one, the copper 2 hydroxide is a blue precipitate. And the ion 2 hydroxide is a green precipitate. And now getting back to a question we are being asked, using sodium hydroxide, explain how you can be able to differentiate between copper 2 ions and the ion 2 ions. So this is how you can be able to differentiate by observing the color change. So the copper 2 ions is going to give us a blue precipitate, and the ion 2 ions is going to give us a green precipitate. So maybe uh, we can rephrase the question and ask, explain how you can be able to test ion 3 ions. So instead of using ion 2 ions, what if the question was asking ion 3 ions? So if we dissolve sodium hydroxide in ion 3 ions, we are going to get ion 3 hydroxide plus sodium in aqueous form. Now, ion 3 hydroxide is brown in color. So remember, we say that copper 2 hydroxide is blue in color. Ion 2 hydroxide is green in color. It gives a green precipitate, rather. And then ion 3 gives us a brown precipitate. And that's how you can be able to differentiate them using sodium hydroxide. Now, the last question is, is asking... Below is a laboratory preparation of chlorine gas. So study the chart and answer the question that follows. So the first question you are being asked, name W and Y. So name W and Y in the chart that you can see. So we see that W reacts with manganese 4 oxide. So W reacts with manganese 4 oxide. 
and then we get chlorine gas which is moving from the first chamber to the next chamber whereby we have uh, a chamber containing water molecules and then from the water we go to the next chamber whereby it is labeled as Y and then from Y we collect dry chlorine gas. So the first question is asking name W and Y. So in the laboratory preparation of chlorine gas what reacts with manganese for oxide to form chlorine? It is automatically hydrochloric acid. So HCl reacts with manganese for oxide to form chlorine gas. So as you can see, this is the chemical reaction whereby the manganese for oxide reacts with the hydrochloric acid, whereby we are going to react one molecule of manganese for oxide reacting with four molecules of hydrochloric acid. We are going to get one molecule of manganese chloride plus two molecules of water and then one molecule of chlorine. Now this chlorine is in gaseous state. And looking at the chart, we see that this formed chlorine now moves to the next chamber whereby we have water molecules. So what is the function of water? Why must chlorine pass through water? So the chlorine must pass through water in order to absorb all the HCl or the hydrogen chloride gas fumes. So all the hydrogen chloride gas fumes must be absorbed. But where is the hydrogen chloride gas fumes coming from? So remember in the first chamber, we used heat. So we heated the solution or we heated the components in order to speed up the rate of reaction. Now in speeding up the rate of reaction, we see that some of the hydrogen chloride uh, gases escaped from the first chamber and then to the next chamber where, whereby we have water. Now, there again comes the function of water. So the function of water in this experiment is to absorb all the hydrogen chloride gas fumes that were produced. So remember in the previous number uh, we saw that we can use uh, we saw that the hydrogen chloride is very soluble in water. Now since hydrogen chloride is very soluble in water it's going to dissolve very quickly in water. Now getting back to this experiment we see that we have water there in order to absorb all the hydrogen chloride gas fumes that are going to be formed in the first part of the experiment. Now from the, uh, from the water chamber we go to the next chamber whereby it is labeled as Y. So this chamber Y, uh, really we can't know the name of Y unless we go to the last step. So in the last step we see that we are collecting dry chlorine gas. So if, since we are collecting dry chlorine gas we know that therefore the chamber Y has a drying agent. So Y must be a drying agent. So since Y must be a drying agent we see that it must be sulfuric acid because sulfuric acid is one of the best drying agents for gases in the laboratory. And in the laboratory preparation of chlorine gas, we directly use conch hydrochloric acid to dry chlorine. Therefore, this gives us an idea that Y must be conch sulfuric acid and not aqueous, but it must be conch sulfuric acid in order to absorb all the water molecules that will be coming along with the chlorine. So the function of the dry hydrochloric acid is to absorb all the water molecules that have come along with the chlorine from the previous chamber of water. Now after that is now when we collect the dry chlorine gas. So let's go to the next question whereby the first question we have named, so name W and Y. So W we say this hydrochloric acid and then Y we say this conch sulfuric acid. It must be concentrated sulfuric acid. So the next question in letter B we are being asked, what is the use of water? Yeah, so uh, we say that the function of water is to absorb all the hydrogen chloride gas fumes. Never name it as hydrochloric gas fumes. It must be named hydrogen chloride gas fumes uh, that were formed in the first part of the experiment.